Let me hear you say crooks, yeah! Crooks, yeah! Let me hear you say crooks, yeah! Crooks, yeah! Crooks, yeah podcast. Crooks, crook! Crooks, yeah! What is going on? It is another Tuesday, which means you get another episode from me. Dude, I got a customer service update for you. I got comedy updates for you. I got all kinds of shit to update you on. Thank you for listening, whoever is right now. Another week as we go into the second half of September. And it is uh, the 21st. That's right. September 21st, 2021. It's 21 on 2021. So, 2 one Two zero two one. Those are your lottery numbers for the week. And if you lose, don't blame me, motherfucker. I'm not playing them. I don't know, dude. Anyway, just finishing up. I'm getting my voice recovered here from uh, doing a little. I uh, had to do some. Had to get paid to do a little vocal feature. Someone, uh, a fan, or you know, another producer, or whatever that has a another music project hit up uh hit up you know hit us up hit we are the flesh up and ask me to do uh you know if i would feature which i do if i like the the music or you know from time to time people hit me up and i'll you know ask them what they want from me do they want a verse do they want a chorus you know how much you know vocal do they want from me and what style and then uh i'll give them a price quote for that feature based on that but this kid he hit me up and he was like hey man i'm a student can you help me out? I'm looking for this, this, and this checked out the track. So it was cool. I I went for it. I did it for him. I was like, yeah, I'll help you out. You know what I mean? took a, took a, you know, made a little compromise on the price quote for the feature, but it is what it is. You know, uh, I got paid. I had some fun. I laid down some stuff, wrote some lyrics, did some vocals, which is always good. It's the other half of what I do, man, music and comedy. So if I get to do one of those things and get paid for it, man, That's nothing to complain about at all. So anyway, um, yeah, I just got done doing a little vocal feature. Hit me up for that earlier this week. Finally had a chance to knock it out just now. So I was doing a lot of screaming, which I haven't done in a while. Haven't done um, a ton of of screams um, in a a long time, in a while. So did some, you know, for our Halloween track, a little bit of... uh, stuff on the chorus a little bit of screaming action but this guy wanted some some hardcore stuff so i had to bang that out but i'm fine i'll recover i always do i already sound like i'm recovered so i think i'm fine but yeah man um just taking a little sip of that coffee yeah man um crazy week busy week and uh really cool you know really cool for comedy too you know um I uh, came back from, let's see, what is today? Yeah, so I, last week I came back from Baltimore and went and did the um, went and did a comedy competition at Magoobie's Joke House, which is a great venue. I finally saw it in person. It's even better than I thought it would be. You know, a lot of comics that I, you know, am a fan of and love, um, you know, tour there all the time and, and play shows there, you know, perform all the time. So it was really cool to see that club in person. And uh, be on that iconic stage because they have the the logo, the you know Magoobie's Joke House in the background, so it's like right in back of you on stage. Uh, yeah, so I got there um, the morning of the competition, which was last Wednesday. Checked into my hotel. They were nice enough to let me check into the hotel early, so that was cool. And um, you know, got to hang out in the room. Um, the weather was, you know, weather in in, in Baltimore was. Uh, pretty much the same as, as, uh, here in Dallas, Fort Worth right now. It's, you know, it was like, you know, high eighties, you know, 90 ish, you know, hot and humid, sunny. So the good thing is it wasn't stormy, you know, it wasn't rainy, you know, so there wasn't any like weather that would like delay flights or, you know, you know, prohibit anybody from coming to the show or whatever. So that was cool. You know, hung out, um, they had a, a Chili's next door, so I went and had some food there, hung out, killed some time, uh, walked over to the 7-Eleven, um, and uh, yeah, man, um, just basically hung out until, 
it was time to go over there and it was cool, which I didn't even realize. I did not plan this. I did not realize this until I got there when I was at this hotel. The hotel is uh, it's a Holiday Inn that's literally like walking distance. I plugged the address to, of the comedy club, a Magoobie's Joke House, in, into my maps, you know, on my phone. And I was like, oh, it's a four minute not drive. It's a four minute walk. You know what I mean? Because I assumed I was going to have to Uber over there because I Ubered from the airport. It was like a 30 minute drive. So uh, I was like, cool, that's awesome, man. I could just walk. And it was literally once I did make the walk over there, it was right down the street. I'm talking it was exactly four minutes, if not less, you know, because I'm fucking tall. So I probably walk in bigger strides than the average person. But yeah, man, um, it was really cool. I walked right up there, hung out, talked to some other comics before the show, uh, went in there. It was a crowd. So we get, you know, there's a meeting, you know, the, the, the chick who, the comic who is the, the host, you know, was running the event. Basically, she was basically quarterbacking the whole thing and kind of corralling all the comics, you know, which at the open mic level, you know, which I'm at, you know, is, is always interesting because anybody can sign up for competitions. Anybody can sign up for regular open mics, you know? So you got a variety of different people with a lot of different skill levels and experience levels all in one room. You got people that have no idea. It's their first time ever being at a comedy club in general, let alone performing at one. Um, you got, I was up against, um, a couple, couple people, um, that, you know, had been doing comedy for years. Uh, you know, so obviously that this was no thing to them at all. And then here I am kind of in the middle ish, you know, I'm still brand, brand new, but you know, I've, I've been doing four plus mics a week, you know, since June, you know, and, uh, I've been, you know, working on my set. So I, I have, you know, a lot of open mic experience at this point, just because I've been doing a lot in a little bit of time. So I knew what was going on. She was kind of giving us the run through, like, you know, you can't say this, can't say that. It was funny. She basically was like, there's two rules here. You can't say the N word if you're not black and you can't say the F word if you're not gay. <laughs> that was pretty much it. That's what she said. You, otherwise, you can talk about anything else on stage tonight. It was just kind of funny. I've never heard anybody spell it out like that, that like, you know, that simple, be that straightforward about it. Like, look, just don't say this and don't say that unless you are that kind of person. That's it. <laughs> it was funny. But, uh, but yeah, man, um, I, uh, it was cool. It was cool. So she was going through all these rules and then I kind of interrupted her for a second. You know, I was like, Hey, excuse me, you know, uh, are you going to be hosting? And then she was like, Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to be host. I'm going to be the host. You know, sorry. I should have told you that I'm going to be the host everybody. So that was kind of cool, you know, cause I was kind of like, it was like, it was nice for me to sit there and listen to her kind of give this rundown. And obviously I was nervous cause I'm in a state I've never performed in before. I've done this material only in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, you know, my five, seven minutes, whatever material that I have, if I did everything that I could have and remember, have and could remember on stage. So I don't know. I'm in, I'm out of my element. I'm in a venue I've never been to before. I don't know anyone there. I don't know any of the comics. I don't, you know, I've, you know, I've been to Maryland once a long time ago and that's it. No experience. No, no, I don't know anybody. So it was kind of cool to kind of get my bearings that way and be like, ah, yeah, holy shit. I just said to myself while I'm listening to this lady talk to the group of us in the back office, like, oh man, I kind of, I, I know what I'm talking about a little bit here. At least I kind of have enough experience to say, okay, so I assume you're hosting this. So that was cool. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, so she gave us the rundown and then we went out and then she started going through, we went back up to the top. It's really cool. If you haven't been to Magoobie's joke house, it's an awesome venue. Um, because it's like stadium style. So there are different levels. So it's not like uh, a comedy club that's just on one floor level and you got tables that, you know, back up from the stage on the same level as the stage. The stage is at, at the you know front and center uh, of the room, and then you have tables that are right next to the stage. But then you have different levels that go up and up and up. I think there was like four, like that you know it's stadium style. So like everybody sits above you and they look down to the stage, unless you're on the floor. So that was pretty cool. It was like kind of like a concert hall style. Um, so. Um, we all sat in the way back, but then people started showing up. They started, you know, seating people at the tables and, uh, it was really cool, man. There ended up being, I have to give, I don't know the exact number, but I would say no less than 80 and no more than 120 people. I would, if I had to give you a round number, 
uh, on the nose. If I guess, I'd say there was around 100 people there, which is the biggest audience that I've performed for since I started doing stand-up comedy, which once again is no time at all, but still. It's it's my it was a big deal for me that night because I had not, I have not to date I had not performed stand up comedy in front of that many people I've performed music in front of a hundred plus people a bunch of times you know but uh, I've never uh, done stand up in front of that many it's usually been you know ten twenty at the most you know twenty at the most at these open mics that I'm performing at you know so. That was really intimidating, and then on top of that, to add to the stress, to add to the anxiety of that, you know, being out of my element, being in a place where I don't know anybody, I flew in from a different state, uh, and then being in this venue where it looks like it's going to be pretty full, um, they, um, the lady, you know, the 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 host, the comic that was hosting, you know, that that's you know native to the venue, she. Um, was starting to go through the role of comics. She started going through the roll call. And then she was like, oh, this guy's not here. This guy's not here. This guy's not here. Like, you know, there were still, I'd say, 20 plus comics that still were there to compete. But a couple people didn't show up. So um, I got bumped up to the top of the list. So here I am. Not only am I, you know, out of my element in all these ways I'm telling you about. But then on top of that, I have to go first. So I was like, oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I wanted to tape my set. Um, so I'm like, can I set my camera up? Can I do all that? And she's like, yeah, you can tape your sets. No problem. Then she was like, don't worry. The host was like, don't worry because, um, even though you're first, I'm still going to do 10. I'm going to introduce the show and then I'm going to say what's up to everybody. And I'm going to do 10. I was like, oh, perfect. Cool. So she's going to kind of set the tone. She's going to get everybody warmed up a little bit. I was like, thank God. So yes, I'm going to be the first comic, which is, uh, you know, that's intimidating for sure. Um, made me a little bit nervous. Um, but hey, at least I'm not like going up cold open like, hey, let's start the show. Here's Crux Crawford. You know what I mean? So uh, that was cool. So while she was doing her 10 minute set and introducing the show to everybody, um, I was setting up my camera, got my little my little setup going, my little gimbal and uh, got a good angle on the stage. And it was funny because right as I got um, a really good angle on the stage, um, uh they had to start seating people because which was a good problem to have. So I'm not complaining by any means, but there were so many people, they filled up the floor level of tables and then they had to start seating the next upper level as it starts to go up, right? The stadium style. So I had to, I got the perfect angle, but then I, the, the server was like, Hey, you got to move, you got to move your camera. Cause I got to seat people. I was like, Oh shit. So I had to start over. Not a big deal. Once again, good problem to have more people, the better, right? So I move up to the next level. I'm like, I'm sure they're not going to fill out this entire, this entire thing all the way around and then having to come up here. So I was like, there's no way. And, and they didn't. So that, which was good. So then I came up to the next level, had plenty of time to reset my angle, make sure the stage was good. Um, and, uh, try to do a good combination of the stage also with capturing at least a portion of the crowd. So you can see the decent amount of people there combined with like getting a good angle of, you know, image of me performing on the stage. So it was cool. And it was the first time I actually filmed and filmed and recorded audio and video, my set in general, anything, audio, video, anything. It's the first time. And a lot of, a lot of comics have told me so far, um, you know, you should tape your sets. You should at the very least record on your phone while you're performing, uh, let alone, you know, some guys, you know, that I know they'll, they'll film and, and audio record on their phone every single set. And I hadn't done that yet until Wednesday night in Baltimore because, I was kind of like, I understand the importance of that. And I definitely intend on doing that a bunch. But when I was first, first trying to figure out what the hell I was doing for like my first five minutes, I didn't really think it was super important. Cause I'm like, yeah, let me get some material going. Let me see if I can make some people laugh. Let me see if I can come up with some actual funny shit and let me bomb through the shit. That's not funny first. And then after that, once I start getting my bearings a little bit, then I'll start taping it. And, uh, the five minutes, that I had ready to perform this, this night, you know, in Baltimore, um, you know, I, it's a tight five minutes. I can remember it off the top of my head. You know what I mean? It's stuff that I've tried with multiple crowds that do not care about me that have been at open mics, um, that have laughed repeatedly. It's material that's done well over and over. So I was like, man, I'm confident that I can do well in this. And I'm confident that this is worth taping, um, which is great. So, uh, um, the, the host, right. The chick, you know, she's been doing comedy for years. Um, she does her thing up there. Didn't really pay attention too much. Cause I was so 
you know, preoccupied with making sure the camera was right, making sure it was ready to roll, making sure it was actually going to record, uh, you know, making sure that I was supposed to be, cause she gave us all instructions like, Hey, you need to be on this side of the stage. When I call you, you need to be right there. You're going to exit on the other side. So anyway, I'm there. I go to, uh, you know, she's wrapping her setup. So I hit record on my phone, make a mad dash down the stairs to the left side of the stage. Cause I know she's going to get ready to call me soon. And then, uh, yeah, she calls me up and, uh, and yeah, man, I go up there and I'm just in my head. I'm like, holy shit, here we go. First time in front of a big crowd in a completely different state where I've never tried out this material before. And, uh, you know, I'm keeping my composure on the outside, but yeah, on the inside, I'm like, holy shit. One thing that was funny that I noticed when she brought me up, when the host, I forgot her name, but she was really nice, really cool person. Um, had a good time doing the show with her. When she, what everybody does here, at least in Dallas, Fort Worth is, is they're doing, especially with COVID and all that stuff, everybody does fist bumps. So whenever the host announces you as the comic and brings you up on stage, uh, you do the fist bump, you know? And, um, uh, you know, and then, and then you take the mic and do all that. She didn't, I went to give her a fist bump cause I'm so used to doing that here. She didn't do that. They don't, they weren't doing fist bumps there. And I don't think it was even COVID. I think it was just like, they just don't do it. I don't know. It's weird. Uh, who knows what's going on with that? Maybe that was just a one-off thing for that night, or maybe she just assumed that everybody's going to be kind of new because it's a open mic competition. It's a comedy competition, uh, or what, but that was something that, you know, you're like, dude, she didn't give you a fist bump. Who gives a fuck? I don't care. <laughs> I don't know, man. It was significant to me. Okay. So fuck you. If you don't like it. Um, no, it was, it was weird. Anyway, that threw me off, but I, it was whatever. It was a small detail. I didn't care that much. So anyway, I start my set and, uh, man, you know, I, I did well. My goal was to keep it like as clean as I possibly could. My closing joke, uh, you know, it has profanity, but it's not really, I just wanted to challenge myself, you know? So I kept everything clean up until that ending joke, which I don't even know if I could, if I could even make that unclean and have it still be funny just because of the way that the delivery is. But who knows? I might try it in the future. Either way, I didn't want to experiment too much tonight because I wanted to make sure I got a good tape of my uh, five-minute set. Then I looked back. So I ended up doing six minutes. And long story short, I did really well. I did really well because uh, I could feel it. I could hear it on stage, the feedback, the people laughing. And uh, then I um, uh, finished... And I look back at my tape. Turns out I did six minutes instead of five. But hey, that's that's not a big deal. I told him to light me at four. Um, so I had no one. I had about a minute left. I think I went a little longer. But I knew that I, I was allowed to do up to eight, which is why I wasn't really worried about it. So I was like, fuck it. I did eight. Uh, all right, sorry. I can do up to eight. So I ended up doing six when I actually looked at the tape. It felt like five. But it ended up being six. Anyway, um, had a really good set. Uh, host comes back on stage, you know, and she was kind of surprised, you know, cause it's like open my, she doesn't know me, you know? So she probably thought I was just completely inexperienced because I'm not from Maryland and I don't do open mics in the Baltimore area. So she's probably just like, Oh, this guy I've never heard of it. I don't know who he is. Um, you know, she was like, that's a really good job. You know, you did well, that guy did well, you know, and all that stuff. And she's like, give him applause again. Um, and then I went and sat back down with all the comics upstairs, uh, at the back area. And a couple of them were like, Hey man, that was good. You did good. You know? And, and most comics, I mean, especially if they don't know you, like, and they're not friends with you, if you bombed or they thought you were just kind of whatever you did mediocre, no one's really going to say you did good. You know, they might go like, Hey, good set as they leave because they feel like it's rude for them not to say something to you. But these were like, I could just tell the vibe was very much like, Hey, that was good. Like you did well, you know what I mean? Like good job opening. You did well, you know, um, uh, which was cool. It was cool. I felt good. I felt real good. So watch the other comics. We went through the whole other 20, 25, however many other comics there were. And, um, and yeah, man, uh, uh, I ended up making it to the final four because the way they did it was the judges were judging all the comics to go up. So 25, however many fucking comics it was. Uh, and then they make a decision who the third and fourth place uh, com competitors are going to be and who the second and first place competitors are going to be. So I made it to the, the third and fourth and it was between me and this other guy who's been doing comedy for years. I talked to him outside, nice guy, before the show. And uh, the so the winners between the third and fourth and the first and second are not judged 
they're they're decided by applause by audience applause which i already had the the chips stacked against me because because uh i'm not from there you know what i mean i don't know anybody there so I, I mean, a lot of people brought people they knew to support them because they knew that if they got judged, if they made it to the final round, they were going to get, uh, you know, applause to measure, you know, how much people are behind them. So anyway, I was just happy that I made it to the final four. So they did the applause uh, comparison between me and the other guy uh, who was from the area once again. And and hey, either, even so, I mean, regardless, he was super funny. He's been doing comedy for years. I could see the experience. I watched his set, you know, hilarious guy, you know, got a lot of talent. So he, but nonetheless, uh, he won the applause. So he got third place, which I don't think means anything. N- not saying, oh, well, fuck that. It doesn't mean anything. Fuck that. I'm just saying, I don't think that gets you anything. I think it, I think it gets them to recognize your name. So if you come back and you compete again, maybe they, you know, they know you, they see you, they know you did well before. Uh, they're going to pay extra attention this time, see if they want to bring you to between first and second spot. But anyway, uh, he won that one, which is f- totally fine. I was just, once again, I was happy that I g- made the cut to make it to the finals, you know, being that I've been doing comedy for three months. And, uh, you know, I, I made it that far to where these guys who are judging the show, which I assume they're just other comics, or maybe it was the owner of the club. I don't know who they were. They might've just worked there. Who knows? But either way, for them to make a decision, hey, this guy did well. He had a good enough set. He made people laugh enough to the point where we're going to put him as one of the final people we had in mind, that was fucking cool. That was huge. You know, my only main goal and main thing I wanted out of performing at Magoobies was to be able to film my set, especially if I did well, and have it so I could submit, you know, and get booked for guest spots or for host spots as a new guy in in comedy venues and maybe some festivals or whatever. Um if I did well, and I did, I had a good set. The tape looks good. You know, it's decent for what it is. Uh, and it's at a great club with a great size crowd, you know? So I was like, that's all I wanted. If I can capture that and I end up having a good set, then I got a good five minute plus tape, you know, then on top of that, I get selected for the final. So that was cool, man. That was cool. And it really kind of affirms. Yeah. That five, I do have a type five, three months in the game, barely no time at all. Brand, brand new, uh, you know, fresh out of the package still. And uh, I got a type five. So that's cool. I got something I can work with, you know, I guess technically it's six because that's what I ended up doing. But uh, but either way, five plus, we'll say, you know, between five and seven, <clears throat> anything more than seven right now, I feel like I'd be reaching and I'd be just doing stuff that's kind of a test, you know, so if someone asked me how much time I'd still say probably say five, seven and stretching it, but who cares? Anyway, uh, that was cool. I made it to the finals, you know? And then, uh, so that guy won third and then the other, this other lady who's been doing comedy for a while, um, got first couple things that threw me off though, about the competition. This is my first comedy competition I've done. And I'm sure that they're all different depending on where you are, you know, what state, what city, et cetera, what the venue is. But this one surprised me because a lot of these comics, um, they did crowd work in their sets, you know, um, the winners, the people, the other people, all three other final four, uh, contestants that I was with. And then it's the, the two that won, uh, third and first place by applause. They all did, uh, crowd work. Like they started their sets with crowd work. And I guess I was assuming, you know, and obviously that's fine, but it threw me off and I did none because I thought because this is a competition, they just purely want to see your material. I thought it would be like, they're just strictly judging you on stage presence. Maybe your appearance a little bit, maybe. Um, and your, um, and your jokes, like how are you making the audience laugh? Are you funny? And are you telling, uh, good jokes, interesting jokes, you know, but based on what, you know, who won and who else was in the final four, I, you know, I was kind of like, whoa, because they're doing crowd work. Like they're messing with people. They're talking to people in the front row. You know, they're bringing it back. to. Be, and, and I'm just kind of like, hmm, I don't know. Like I, I was just kind of like, I just assume anybody can do. Now, granted, there are people that are phenomenal car, crowd work and there are comics that have been doing it for years and years and years that are better than anyone out there. There's certain comics that are just great crowd work comics. Um, you know, and that's great. I just assumed that at this level, you know, if you're in this comedy competition, maybe they just want to see the content of your material. Like, what do you have? You know, 
Um, but hey, that was that was just something that threw me off um, initially, which is fine. I just I know that next time if I ever compete there again, um, I know that that's okay to do at least at that one. Um, but yeah, so the thing that you get out of that when you win that competition is you get you're automatically entered into their funniest person of the year. Um, so uh, every month they have that competition. So. I might come back. I might go back and do it. You know what I mean? I might get the, the competitive urge to see if I can not only get selected again, but if I can get to that number one spot. Um, but who knows, man. For now, where I'm at, my level, I'm more than happy that uh, that I got that, you know, that I did that. That's amazing. And I'm super uh, content. I got a good tape. That's great. I got some good footage at a good club with a good crowd, like I said. So that's all I really care about. Um but yeah, that was a good night. Went back, flew back the next, uh, went back to the hotel, flew back the next uh, afternoon, came back here, uh, you know, missed my family, missed my baby boy, and I uh, got to spend some family time. What did I do when I got back to the house? I, uh, I worked, and then I did this vocal feature we went to another birthday. We went to because it was my my kid's first birthday last weekend. So this weekend it was uh, the birthday of this girl that he's a friend. You know, all the moms in the neighborhood where I live here uh, are friends. You know, and they all they all have kids that are either a year or less old. So they're all they all get together and do these little baby parties where all the babies play and have no idea what's going on and climb on top of each other and cry. <laughs> so. It was a, a a mom in our neighborhood that had uh, a baby, uh, another baby that's like a week, you know, a week younger than 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 my son. So we went over there for her little birthday party, um, and that was cool. You know, it was fun. Um, very nice people, very nice house. Uh, yeah, it was cool. Um, there was, uh, you know, it's funny because I'm just realizing babies are that's what I have right now. I only have a baby and I have another one on the way. I don't have toddlers. I don't have kids that are elementary school age or anything like that. I just, I just have this baby. Right. So I'm like, babies are really cool. I'm sitting there watching two or three of them play together, you know, watching my kid play with like this, these other baby boys and baby girls and eating food and just stumbling around and trying to balance themselves on shit. And, uh, babies are cool. Toddlers, kind of suck because this toddler girl comes in to the picture and uh she just like you know the babies they, they could barely they're just blabbing they can't really talk yet they can't really walk yet you know they're standing and they're crawling but that's it so they're just having fun with each other and then this toddler girl comes into the mix i'm enjoying watching my son with the other babies and then this girl comes up and she's like hi i'm chelsea i'm three or whatever i'm just like no one gives a shit get the fuck out <laughs> get the fuck out of here dude like you know, obviously I didn't say that, but it was just kind of like, dude, no one cares. Okay. I'm watching these babies. All right. I don't want to hear your opinions and your simple facts. And I don't fucking know you. And no, you can't have any of my grapes on my plate. <laughs> nah, man. Um, but it was just funny because that's a, it, it shows you, even though it's a year or two apart or whatever, it shows you how crazy fast kids develop. Right? Cause that girl was like in a completely different league you know, than these babies, but you know, they're like a year and a half apart, you know? So it was just kind of interesting to see that other aspect. Cause I don't spend a lot of time around little kids, you know? Um, you know, when you have a baby, you kind of get a uh, cut off from your friends that don't have kids or your family members that don't have kids yet. You know, even if you have similar interests, you don't end up spending a lot of time around each other. Cause they're, they'll, they'll do stuff that you, you know, you don't want to do if you have a baby. So I only spend time around uh, comics when I'm out performing at open mics and stuff and working on comedy. And then uh, all my other friends I talk to on the phone because most of them are back in L.A. So I just talk to them on the phone. You know what I mean? Um, when I'm driving around working or when I'm hanging out at home, uh, I don't see a lot of other parents that have kids that are older than babies. So being exposed to like toddlers or, you know, there were some kids that were like, you know, like five, six, seven years old there. Um, 
it was different for me. It kind of threw me off a little bit because I'm not used to dealing with children. You know, I've never worked with children. I'm not a school teacher. I'm, I've never done, never done child care. So it was just kind of interesting because you get so used to how a baby is developmentally, you know, and you just think like, ah, that's just what I'm dealing with, you know, and then you get exposed to someone that's the kids that are older and it's just funny to see how they develop and how they deal with shit. But yeah, it was a packed place, man. They had a lot of family. They're all from here, from this area in Texas. So, you know, they had a lot of people there that they knew and all their families there and stuff on both sides, the mom and the dad. But yeah, it was cool. They had a nice spread, you know, nice spread of food, nice spread of drinks. It was like a two minute drive from the house. So it was real convenient, had some fun. Hit the gym after that. Um, it was weird yesterday, man, because it uh, looks like it's fine today. But yesterday, there was like no cell reception. I got AT&T. At least for AT&T, there was no cell reception anywhere. So I went to the gym, got to the gym, about to play my Spotify playlist for all my music and my jams and shit while I'm working out. And uh, I realized, holy shit, I got no bars. I got no reception. So... Uh, I got back in my truck, drove back home and, you know, got back on my Wi-Fi and downloaded all my music shit because I've gotten so addicted to the point where I can't go work out if I don't have music or a podcast or something to listen to. Some people think I'm weird for even listening to podcasts while I work out. Some people are like, dude, how can you get into it? How can you, you know, how can you get all extreme? How can you get in the zone if you're just listening to people talk? I don't know if it's interesting enough. I'll listen to it. Um, obviously I certainly do love music, uh, when I work out too. But I can't, I'm one of those weird people, man, that can listen to music or podcasts while I'm working out, while I'm lifting or running or whatever I'm doing. But I certainly can't just have silence anymore, man. You know, like, yes, obviously, is it life or death? No. Could I do it if I was forced to or if I really wanted to? Sure. But if I have a choice, you know, drive five minutes back to my house, download some shit, which takes like a minute, you know. And then fucking drive back to the gym. Why not? You know, I can. So why not? So I get back in. You know, download all the stuff that I usually just use cellular data to stream or whatever, and then pop back to the gym. I got all my shit. I'm rocking and rolling. Got my AirPods in, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, so that was cool. <clears throat> and uh, what was I going to say about that? I fucking forgot. But yeah, did that, came back. Um, then we were so fucking tired from the party and everything like that that we just decided we didn't even want to eat. Uh, or we didn't want to make anything, so we just went out and ate. Um, and, uh, yeah, dude, I got to tell you, the fucking, like I said before at the beginning of this episode, the, the, the so I'm going to have a door installed this week, finally, after 20 times of saying it was going to happen, you know, and, uh, the, cut, dude, this place, man. They said, so over and over it kept getting delayed, right? The door, my order of the door, the company that's making it, like they kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Then the guy the sales guy calls me and says, Hey, uh, it will be ready, you know, tomorrow. So just call me. So I call him. This was a, over a week ago, call him. And then they're like, Oh, he left. I asked the guy's name. I say, Hey, can I talk to this guy? He's got my door order or whatever. He said it was going to be ready. And they're like, ah, oh, he just, uh, he's on vacation. He's having surgery. And it's like, ah, oh, dude, well, thanks a lot for telling me the day before you go when you told me to call back. So, uh, I call back and, uh, you know, um, they couldn't find it <laughs> and then they found it again. And then they said it was going to be a couple more days. So supposed to be tomorrow. I'll believe it when I see it. My contractor is supposed to go pick it up tomorrow morning, you know, so we'll see what's up. Uh, and then, Hey, then I can continue with getting the podcast studio going if it actually does happen. And, uh, and yeah, that I can keep rolling with this thing um, and actually get the shit set up with the cameras and the fucking table and everything that I want to get set up uh, so I can keep this going and get it developed the way that I want it to with guests and all that good shit, um, you know, and have everything cut off, you know, from, uh, from noises in the rest of the house and stuff, which would be cool. Um, and uh, what else happened? So there's that. I got that going on. And uh, yeah, dude, it's just so funny that the level, I'll tell you, man, I, I, I still do sales and I've been in sales for years and years, man. I've done pretty well at it and I've been kind of good at it, you know, for whatever reason, just with the fucking gifts that I have. That's one of the 
small handful of things that I'm skilled at doing or whatever, you know, there's a lot of shit. I have no idea what I'm doing with, but that's one of the things that I've been able to do pretty well. And I'll tell you, man, this place, like these salespeople at this company that made this door, dude, I don't know how they get by because I'll tell you, man. And I'll tell you anybody, if you took like camera footage or you went and, and found like my most recent server at a restaurant I ate at, most recent cashier somewhere that I paid for it at the, at the counter, most recent drive through employee that I took a drive through order from. Just what my point is, if you got, you went and found a bunch of people together that served me, like it was their job to give customer service to me, I guarantee you all of them would tell you that I was a really courteous customer, which I am 99% of the time. Um, yeah, they'll tell you that I'm a good tipper. You know, I, t- I tip decently, if not very well. You know, because I've I've done that job. I've worked in restaurants, man. I've worked for tips. And I understand if you give good service, you deserve a good tip. That's something that I've always stood by because I've been there. I've, I've sat in that seat. I've worn those shoes. So the, my point is I'm a decent person, man, with the way I treat people. And I make a point to do that because I've had a lot of those jobs in my life, you know. And uh, also just general decency, man. Just be. I know what it's like to judge people when you're on that side of the counter. You know what I mean? And I know what it's like to be like, ah, that was a cool customer. That guy's a fucking dickhead. You know, that chick's a bitch. You know, uh, that guy was rude. And, you know, I just want to make people feel like, you know, dignified in their job because what they're doing is hard. And what they're doing is, is sometimes mundane, man. Taking people's orders one after the other, after the other, after the other. That shit gets old. I've done it for hours. I've done it, you know. So I try to be nice, man. I try to treat people right. Um, and then if it's a job where gratuity is part of their income, I try to take care of them. You know what I mean? Or if they get a little tip jar, I try to take care of them, you know? So my, you know, I'm saying, I'm not saying, Oh, I'm so cool. I'm such a great person. I'm just saying I'm a decent, I I understand the concept of treating people right. And these people, dude, I'll tell you, it's inexcusable. Like the, the amount of incompetence and the lack of customer service, they literally answer the phone. Like you're, first of all, when they answer the phone, they act like you're bothering them. They act like they end like, Hey, Hey, yeah, what's up? Like they say the name of the company, but they say it like, yeah, what's going on? What's up? I'm busy. You know? And it's like, dude, that's red flag. Number one. And the fact they have nothing, no clue what's going on is, is, is red flag. Number two, it's just, I'm in a rock and a hard place. Cause I don't know shit about doors, which is why I'm having somebody order it for me. And, and, uh, you know, I want it. So I, if I cancel, then I'm gonna have to start the whole process over somewhere else. So I can't, I'm, I'm, my hands are tied at this point. There's nothing I can really do except just kind of bite the bullet. But it's just like, dude, I just can't believe the level of, you know, customer service. Cause, and, and the reason why I gave that whole fucking speech before I said that was because you read these Yelp reviews, you read Google reviews, you go online and you can tell when someone's just like a little sensitive bitch about something. You can tell when they're like, I never in my life if I was like, I would never go online and type that. Like the only negative things, I'm just saying, dude, they're, they're fucking up at this company. The service sucks. My contractor agrees with me. He can't believe it either. So I know I'm not alone and I'm not a dramatic person. I try to avoid all that shit at all costs. I try to treat people right and take care of them the best I can. There have been, have there been points in my life where I'm having a bad day or something? I've talked about it in this podcast. Absolutely. Like there have been times when I've been a dickhead customer. They're very few and far in between though. And that has not happened for a very long time. Like we're talking years that I've acted like that. So generally speaking, man, try to be pretty decent. And, uh, you, you, the only time I've left like horrible Yelp reviews on anything was the first apartment that my girlfriend now wife, when she's, you know, we, we, the first place we lived at together, got infested with roaches. We had to, you know, fucking get rid of everything and buy new furniture, all that shit. Cause they travel with you to the new place. So that apartment building, uh, we had to break our lease cause they wouldn't help us. And then they tried to take our deposit, even though it was their fault that we were leaving. So I left them a horrible review. People that live there afterwards will still till this day will message me on Yelp or they'll email me or they'll comment on my review or whatever the fuck they do. I forget how that app works. Either way, people will reach out to me and go, hey, you were right. Like this place sucks. Like, or I went and checked it out and then I read your Yelp review and you saved me from signing a 12 month lease with these assholes. Like, so people, I know I'm not alone because they're like, nah, this place is a shithole. 
uh, or I'll get other people that were tenants there also either after we already moved out or at the same time when we lived there and go, hey, like, let's together and let's get a class action lawsuit, which I'm way too fucking lazy. And I spent a year in small claims court, get my deposit back from those pieces of shit anyway. So the last thing I want to do is open a can of worms with that. But my point is people go, hey, man, you were right. That's a bad review. I cannot think off the top of my head. There might be one more that I'm just is, is escaping me right now. But other than that, I honestly can't remember the last time I gave a review. What I try to do is positive vibes, positive energy. You know, I try to give good reviews. You know, if there's a horrible place, I usually don't say anything unless it's like just inexcusable, unless it's bad, you know. Um, if it's kind of mediocre service or whatever, I don't go on there and go, meh, 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 meh. it could have been a little better if they did it. I don't do that. If it's fucking terrible, like inexcusable, undebatably terrible, yes, I might I might leave a review just to not really to complain at the place, but more to warn people. Um, or maybe if the manager reads it, if the guy who owns it or the GM reads it, then maybe he'll be like, hey, we got to correct this problem, you know, and maybe or hey, say, hey, we're sorry you had experience. We're not really like that. Let me come back. Let me show you who we really are. You know, that's cool. But uh but yeah, like I try to leave positive. So when I have, cause you know what they say, if you've ever had any kind of sales or customer service job, or if you've ever studied it, or if you've ever taken any like classes on, you know, uh, customer service or public speaking or whatever, they'll, they'll teach you and you'll learn just like I've learned, um, that most people like nine times out of 10 people will not, um, talk or brag online or talk to other people, their friends, their family and whatever about a restaurant or a business or a, a place that they had a great experience at because people just expect things to work. They expect to have a good experience. They expect to have a good time. They expect to be taken care of. And when they, when they aren't, or when things don't go well, that's when the alarm bells go off in the average person's brain and that's when they're prompted to go and complain. So people way more often will complain about a bad experience than, than, uh, than rave. They're way more likely to rant about a bad one than to rave about a good one, right? So unfortunately for restaurants and all kinds of businesses, especially the small ones that depend on a lot of word of mouth to get money, to get business, to get customers, uh, the good experiences are, are far less talked about and bragged about than the, the negative ones, right? Um, so to count, to combat that, you know, especially since I've learned that and I, you know, I've also, like I said, I was in sales for years. I was in the car business for years. Part of my income for a long time with different positions I had at the car dealerships, finance, sales guy, you know, whatever, uh, part of the income and bonuses that you would get every month, part of your commission, which you're working a hundred percent commission. That's how you make a paycheck. Uh, comes from getting uh, good surveys. So if you didn't get 100%, if you got less than 100% on some of these surveys, um, it could severely jeopardize you getting part of your bonus pay, which is a large part of your income. So we're talking thousand, if not thousands of dollars down the drain if you don't get that 100%. So you try to tell that to customers and some are pieces of shit and don't care and don't listen to you. Some do try to take care of you. I try to be that customer now that I'm on the other side of the coin and I'm that customer and I don't depend on that anymore. I know what it's like. So I try to give people, um, I try to go out of my way to put good energy out there and give people good feedback and give them five stars and good ratings. So most Yelps and stuff, when I do them, uh, I do it because to, to, to rave. I do it to say, hey, this place is great. If you're looking for this restaurant or this thing, they're awesome. I did that to my dry cleaner back in LA before I moved. And he's just got a small little one-man operation. It's him, his son, then he's got a couple employees working for him. But, um, you know, they always gave good service and they were my local spot. I walked to them. So I, you know, on Yelp, I noticed they were on there and uh, I gave them a five star review, said, hey, this place is great. Come take your clothes here, et cetera. And, you know, it's a small place, like I said. So he pays attention to stuff like that. And he's the guy that takes care of it. So I came in just not even remembering that I gave the Yelp review and I dropped my clothes off to get dry cleaned. And uh, he was like, hey, like. Thanks for that review. I saw you, you know, cause I got my profile picture on there and everything. So he's like, Hey, I saw that review, man. I read it. I saw the five stars. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I was like, Oh yeah, no problem, man. You know, I try to help places out, give, you know, if I have good experience, talk about the good experience, you know, and my point is it comes back to you and people, people, you know, appreciate it. Uh, I would, if I was running my own little, if I, you know, thank God for fucking music and comedy and shit, I don't rely on fucking Yelp reviews. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
just got to read some hater YouTube comments sometimes. But outside of that, it's not like I'm running a restaurant or a dry cleaning place where I got to, you know, if I get too many bad reviews, then I might lose some customers. Uh, you know, if I was in that position, though, I would want people that had a good experience to talk about it. You know, hey, if you like what you if you, if you like what you the service you had here, please tell people so they come and see me, too. And if you didn't like something, hey, do me a favor. Why don't you just come to me and tell me what I can improve on so I can help you out? You know, as long as you're not crazy or unreasonable, you know, let me help you out. Um, but yeah, man, so long fucking customer service rant, but <clears throat> it is rare, especially here. I'll tell you, man, Dallas, Fort Worth out here in Texas. Uh, you got a lot of places that are really phenomenal customer service. I have not yet had a bad restaurant experience here. I've had some, I've had one restaurant that had shit food. The food was horrible. The rest have been delicious. And even at the restaurant where the food was horrible, the service was really good, especially considering they were super fucking busy and they still took care of us. So a lot of great customer service out here in Dallas, Texas, man, Dallas, Fort Worth area and uh, delicious food and great service. Way better restaurant customer service than in LA. I can tell you that. Like it's it's crazy how much people pay attention here and how great the servers are, how courteous they are, and how much they take care of you. I think, and I've talked about this with a couple people. I think the reason for that is because a large part of the service industry in LA are people that are trying to do something else, right? Not to say that people here aren't, but what I'm saying is a lot of people that are service or actors or fucking you know comedians or you know hope to be producers, you know, et cetera. They're doing something else and they think, Hey, you know, you should be, I kind of, you know, I deserve a good tip because I'm doing this as my day job for what I'm really trying to do, even though I don't really want to do it. That kind of vibe, which I would have too. I'm not going to lie. I, if I was in a position where, Hey man, I got to go be a server in a restaurant. Or I got to go be a bartender at a bar or a restaurant. Dude, you better believe I'd be fucking that guy. I'd be that guy that's like, yeah, this isn't what I really want to do. I don't know. I would still try to do a good job, though, because I've depended on, you know, taking care of people for my income. So I would know how important it is to take care of people. But here, I feel like people that are servers, bartenders, et cetera, they might have aspirations to go to school or do something else or become a professional, but they're not necessarily here to be like an actor or something like that, like you would in L.A. So. I think people here are more like, let me work my ass off at this job and give some primo customer service, get some primo tips so that I can move on with what I really want to do. And I think people just accept it as like, hey, this is my job, so I'm going to kick ass at it right now for however long I do it uh, so I can move on. And then I think there are some people that are just like, hey, man, this is what I do. I make good money doing it. I like taking care of people. Um, and uh, I like working in a restaurant or I like working in a bar. And this is what I do. You know, and, and that's fine too. That's great. I love that. Whatever it is, I'm because I'm purely guessing right now, whatever it is, the, whatever the reason is people give such great customer service here in restaurants and bars, just keep it up, man, because it's amazing. I notice the difference. Being somebody that's not originally from Dallas-Fort Worth area and moving here, you know, in the months I've been here, I'll tell you, there's some phenomenal service out there. So some of these places, you know, as this podcast gets bigger and we keep growing Crux Nation, they better start giving me some money for sponsors, bro. I'll throw the names out there. <laughs> nah, man. Uh, but hey, if you're still with me, you're still tuning in. Once again, I want to thank you for listening to me another week. I hope the rest of your week is amazing. And uh, thank you for supporting. Keep spreading the word. Keep helping me grow Crux Nation. We are the Flesh fans and my comedy fans and people that know me. Um, let's keep this momentum going. Uh, looks like I'm going to actually be able to do what I want to do with this podcast, possibly as early as next week. You know, I'm not making any promises anymore because obviously we've seen how that's gone week after week, but man, I promise you, I will get it going as soon as I can. Just like I said before. And in the meantime, once again, keep helping me grow crux nation, crux nation, crux. Yeah. Let me hear you say crux. Yeah. Crux, yeah!